Hi, good day, and welcome to the IT001 class, Advanced Operating Systems. I am Justin Pineda, and I will be the instructor for this course. And for this session, we'll be discussing Module 1, which is the Operating System Concepts. Okay, so um, before we start, we'll have a getting to know. Um, I'll ask your name, position, and organization, where you're taking MSIT. Your interest in operating systems, you can rate it 1 to 10. Your knowledge in operating system in detail, uh, specifically the algorithms, different process schedule algorithms, uh, memory management, etc. So you can rate it also. And your expectations in the course. So I have um, included a link, uh, Google Forms link, where you can answer all these questions and then we'll have a discussion um, in a synchronous session next time okay so for this course we'll be having four modules for the month okay so we start with module one operating system concepts uh, but obviously we have to cover all all the concepts in os and then um, but for the graduate school course, we'll be dealing more on the features and improving the features of current uh, operating systems um, and analyzing limitations and um, basically we're going to optimize the, the operating systems that we have currently. Okay. For modules 2 and 3, we'll do some of the simulations in operating systems such as process scheduling and memory management and for module 4 we'll be discussing about security architecture and design so for the grading system we have only three components so the first one is learning lag which is 20 percent so this talks about your insights and feed feedback on the module so you will be answering um, sort of survey uh, but there it will ask you what you learned and um, your insights your feedback and your sharings uh, as well so you may have experiences on specific topics that you would like to to discuss you can include that in the learning lag so you, you need to submit one every module <clears throat> and then exercise is 40 percent that would be your assessment for each module so it can be a case study it can be an exercise um, it can be similar to a quiz okay um, or case analysis so, so something like that so you you will have an assessment for each module and last would be your final paper which is for 40 percent you're going to do a comparative analysis of a popular versus a new or a niche operating system and we'll be discussing um, it further along the way um, but for now i suggest that you look for a a new okay or a niche operating system that you will be studying for the course so let's start with module one operating system concepts so these are the topics that we will be discussing the history uh, of os configuration and objectives Job management, task management, data management and file organization, and memory management. Okay. So these are our primary resources for the course. I'll also be sharing the ebooks that you can also use as reference later on when you do your research and when you answer the exercises. So let's start with the operating system history. Okay. So the early times during the 40s, we start with the ENIAC and the EDVAC. If you would remember in your um, in your in your if if your course is IT or ComSci, this would fall under the IT concepts course. So ENIAC stands for um, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, and then Electronic Discrete Variable Autom Automatic Computer for the EDVAC. So this is similar to our calculators now during the 40s um, it's very straight because um, 
there is no interface between the user and the um the hardware so everything is hard coded okay and uh, because the, the functions are very straightforward like this adding uh, subtracting and so on <clears throat> and then during the 40s uh, late 40s programming languages emerge okay 1951 we have the reusable code univac there's as an assembler in 1952 in 1956, the interrupt start, um, started or it was introduced. During the late 50s, we have batch processing already in job control. Okay, uh, and later on, I'm, I'm just um, laying in the timeline, but the the details of what these are, like interrupts and batch processing, will be discussed further. Okay, I'm, we're just pointing out that as early as 40s. Um, the 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 goal for the creation of the operating system, although it was not named yet, um, was already existing. Um, in the 1960s, multi-programming, um, multi-processing, and transaction processing was um, introduced. <coughs> so when we say multi-programming, uh, it means that the um, the memory or the RAM can handle um, more than one process at a given time. Okay. And then multi-programming with fixed tasks, multi-programming with variable tasks. So these are the variations which we will be doing in the memory management module. Okay. And in the 60s, the emergence of the mouse also um, Game and then in the 70s we we already have multi-user multitasking virtual machines mo modular architectures portable design personal interactive systems the Ethernet and MS DOS. Okay. In the 80s we we saw the um, start of Windows in 1983 and Apple in 1984. And then we also have the network file systems. In the 90s, uh, we started with the Windows 3.0. Uh, there we found the the start of the Minesweeper, the Solitaire, and um, Linux also started in 1991. Uh, the first Windows virus in 1992, and the browser mosaic, which is already um, obsolete now. Okay. In 2000s, obviously the internet became <coughs> sorry boomed, and then um, it became available to the public. And then um, in the latter part of year 2000, the advent of the smartphones such as iOS in 2007, Andro Android OS in 2008, and in 2009, Internet of Things um, started to revolutionize. Okay, so, uh, just to give you a picture, the concepts that we have right now um, started way back, okay, as early as 50s, okay, the um, the different algorithms for memory management started in the 70s. So virtual virtual memory, virtual machines also started in um, the 70s. Uh, but um, um, it was not realized by the consumer level uh, because it was um, costly back then and only the scientists and the specialists have access to this information. Okay, so this is what the history tells us. Okay. Now let's go to um, configuration and objective of, of operating systems. Uh, so we learned the, some of the terms in the history timeline. Now let's go to the objective and configuration of operating systems. So what is an operating system? Okay. 
So there is no clear definition if you read various references. Um, but we have some common common um, answers like it's the first program. Okay? It's the program that runs another program. Okay? It is what we call a daemon. Okay? It's a disk and execution monitor. Um, usually daemon, uh, the daemon, D-A-E, M-O-N, is um, a process that runs in the background. Okay? I mean to say, you run the operating system, you cannot um, you can run a program in the operating system, but you cannot close the operating system. That's daemon. It runs in the background. It performs controlled access to resources such as CPU, network, and memory. And the um, in this diagram, it shows that the operating system is the interface between the user and the software and hardware. It's the intermediary between the user and the software and the hardware. And we know that because in the software, you have installers, the operating system handles the, um, the, the, the loading of the software in the memory okay, and the installation of drivers so that the user will be able to use the hardware properly. So um, that's why it's the interface or the intermediary. Okay, so for the configuration of OS, uh, we say that Aside from being it, the first program is also called the basic software, okay? Because it manages the interoperation of hardware and software of a computer system. So some of the the features, the key features of the operating system include control program, okay? um, service program, and language processor. Now, these terms like job management, data management, operation management um, are not um, very, fam uh, may not be familiar for the ordinary user or for the consumer. But as users of the computer system, okay, we are actually asking the operating system to do these things when we load programs, when we run specific actions when we ask the when we, we command the printer to print some papers etc okay. <clears throat> so objectives of the os um, later on when we do our analysis we'll always try to um, to plot this plot an operating system or features of the operate, operating system um, against these objectives. So first would be the effective use of hardware resources, okay, such as multi-programming, spooling functions, etc. Response to various processing modes, uh, securing reliability and safety, okay, um, load reduction of application software, such as virtual memory and library management, and support of computer control and of operations. So these are the core objectives of an operating system. When we say effective use of hardware resources, we include uh, um, the CPU, the memory, okay, the I.O. units, including channels. It also controls um, these resources so that they can be used um, efficiently. Okay. Response to various processing modes. So um, one computer can handle various processing modes such as batch processing. In which we will be doing later on analyzing batch processing later on, remote batch processing, online processing, real time processing, and interactive mode processing. Securing reliability and safety. This is um, so each type of operating system has its um, feature for ensuring reliability and safety. Okay? Like, for example, um, uh, <clears throat> In in iOS, in, in iOS, for example, it uses uh, sandboxing to ensure that uh, applications are um, cannot be um, cannot be directly communicated by an external or third party 
um, application, right? So um, that's an example um, of a feature for a specific OS. So here it indexes for reliability and safety um, called RASIS or reliability, availability, serviceability, integrity, and security. Okay. Um, usually one of the concerns also is the integrity of the, the data um, of the application when it, um, it fails. Will we be able to retrieve the actual or um, the most recent information that we have? And what if that there is a transaction? Will, will we commit or roll back? So something like that. Okay. Load reduction of application software. So application software refers to a program which runs under the control of the operating system. So it provides an environment in which application programs can be efficiently executed. So um, prioritization will, will be a key element. Okay. determining which parts because in the in the early in 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 the early days okay, we the operating system will load the application the entire application directly to the um, to the memory okay. but it's not efficient because it will consume the entire memory and then uh, however you only need a portion of that application um, at a given time so it's the job of the operating system to determine that okay, and support of computer control and operation so the os eliminates human intervention such as much as possible we call it abstraction okay as it processes programs continuously and records the operation status so <clears throat> there is a high abstraction okay, so that we have more usability and the operate, operating system will do the dirty work or the leg work for us. Okay. <clears throat> um, there is a term called kernel, which um, is the core component of the operating system. So it's core meaning it's the inner in the innermost part of the operating system. Okay, so it controls the process execution, memory management, and resource access. So to gain kernel access means high, a very high privilege or high privilege, um, which means once you go to the kernel, um, you have bypassed certain security measures, strict security measures, because you can control a lot of the major, um, major functions of the computer system. Hmm. And so user uh, the modes in um, the operating system we have user mode kernel mode and hypervisor mode uh, you will see this um, most of the time so by default we are in the user mode okay we're in there's a normal operation such as running a text file and browsing the web okay? <clears throat> but when you need to do something that uh, requires a higher privilege you go to the kernel mode okay so you escalate the privilege and um, you request for that so these are events that affect the performance of the operating system such as when you go to install or um, um, install an application okay, that an antivirus that may directly affect you know, the performance of the operating system that's why you need to, you need an escalated privilege etc <clears throat> or you're going to um, you're going to adjust the um, the memory um, the memory capability of the virtual machine so it may require kernel mode access uh, to grant a specific request okay so how to get to the kernel mode so there's a trap a trap is what we call for transfer of control from the user mode to the kernel mode okay then that is the security best practice that you do not have kernel mode by default and you only get kernel mode when you need it and then you go back to user mode 
Now let's go to job management. So for job management, we have um, we say that jobs are units of tasks given to the computer consisting of multiple programs. So there are job steps. So job management has functions such as scheduling and spooling. So we will discuss this further on um, the other module of the course. <clears throat> but to give you an idea, so we have a scheduler, uh, the reader, initiator, terminator, spooling, and catalog procedure. So when we say scheduler, okay, so in um, job management, jobs are continuously executed under a master scheduler and a job scheduler. So um, if you, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar when you when you bring your um, car for <coughs> for um, preventive maintenance. When you go to the casa, you will see a very um, large uh, whiteboard, and then the schedules are there, and then they will put um, the, the 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 plate number of the car, depending on the the schedule so everybody can see the, the available slots left okay which um which resource or which part uh, which mechanic is available etc so it's similar to that okay you have um it has the entire view okay of all the parts of the memory the applications the resources etc and the the operating system tries to um, map um up to the right um, cell. Okay. <clears throat> so the job scheduler manages the reception, selection, start, and finish of the jobs. Okay, so the reader um, reads the content of the job control language, analyzes them, schedules jobs, and places them in queue. And for the initiator, okay, the initiator selects the programs with high execution priorities among those in the queue and assign the resources that those um, programs need. And the Terminator releases resources that were used by programs just completed. Okay, so if there is another program following, the Terminator stops up the, starts up the initiator. So spooling, um, it's the function of the eye of jobs independent of the program so any output results to low speed the, the keyword here is low speed units such as printer uh, are first stored in a spool file then after the program is finished the output results are printed on the printer from the spool uh, file by the service program of the operating system and we have catalog procedure so in a job execution directions typical processing such as translation of languages uh, is done in the following way so there's a, a, a set of jcls um, registered together at a separate location and this registered set of uh, jcls is called for executing programs okay, so by doing this the computer prevents jcl errors and the set of jcls is called catalog procedures okay. <clears throat> um, now let's go to task management so for task management okay the the <clears throat> the function of controlling the execution of programs um, consists of various procedures such as synchronization control of programs, dynamic assignment, uh, assignment of resources for program execution and management of execution priorities of the programs. So it also conducts various type of interruption control. So pass and job. So when we say job is a unit of processing from the perspective of the user. So if there's a single program or set of programs executed consecutively. So in the perspective of the user, we call it jobs. Okay. Um, whereas when we say task, it's a unit of internal processing executed under the operating uh, system. So it refers to a processing unit that subdivides a program process. Okay. <clears throat> So control of task execution, so task management generates uh, task required in response to a command and monitors the execution process. So when a task generated becomes no longer necessary, the task is eliminated. So we will appreciate this um, in the next modules because we'll try to simulate how <laughs> jobs and tasks work 
and how the operating system handles it. Okay, so these are the transition states. Uh, it varies depending on the the reference. Some some references will have uh, at least eight states. Some um, five states. So we'll focus on the basic um, the basic um, <clears throat> model, okay, which consists of three states: ready, running, and waiting. So <clears throat> let's um, try to simulate. Okay. So when there's a task generation, we're, we're in example. There's um, um, a process that goes in. Okay. By default, it will be in the queue. Okay. So it will be queued and then um, it will register. That's the first step. So, um, yeah. So it will register and then it will go to the ready state. Okay. Now, if there is an interruption, so interruption may be because the <coughs> the uh, the current existing or the current uh, running process um, has terminated already it's already done or it will switch we call it context switching there will be an interruption so for example the current uh, process is already terminated okay, then it will switch okay, there's an interruption and then the the, the the process in the ready state will be dispatched to the running state so it will run now okay <clears throat> and then okay, if there is a supervisor call either um, in number four okay then it, it will wait probably because um, the application will require higher privilege okay, and then um we'll go back to the ready state and then run again so that's the the process and once the the, the process is uh, done then it will be terminated and the task will be eliminated and then off to the next um process in queue so that's how it works Okay, so interruption refers to the temporary suspension of a program currently being executed for any reason and transferring control of the OS to execute some necessary processing program. So it can be external or interrupt, in, internal interruption. So when we say external, it's caused by certain specific states of the hardware. Okay. Um, internal interruption caused intentionally when the control program is called from within the program. Okay. So specific states of the um, hardware, okay, it can be um, the processor, it can be um, input-output devices that will be considered external interruption. Okay. <clears throat> so, for example, here's an, here's an example of um, uh, interruption. So external interruption. Um, we have machine check interruption, so pa possible causes, malfunction of units, um, fault power, or voltage trouble, okay, that is considered external interruption. Uh, for internal interruptions such as traps, we can have a program interruption. It can have, it can be because of overflow, underflow, undefined instruction code execution, a division by zero, memory protection violation, etc. So again, if it is um, hardware, it will fall under external. If it is internal, uh, internal to the application, we call it internal interruption or traps. Uh, we also have what we call call interrupt vector table. So it contains list of addresses of traps. Okay, so it's like a record book, a database containing. <coughs> And the traps in its addresses. Use as reference when trap is called and for what reason. And then use as the jump command to go to that address. So jump command is actually a um, an assembly command, assembly language command. 
And then we also have a system call. So system call is a communication highway for the user to communicate with the um, operating system, specifically when you are going to um, escalate to kernel mode. Okay. So we have types of traps. We have software traps. So we have um, software interrupts when OS confirming installation of ap application. Just for an example, okay. violation and account lockout due to multiple failed login attempts. Um, hardware interrupt when notific when there's a notification because the hard disk is low on storage capacity. Um, now we go to context switching and preemption. So when we say context switching, it's switching from one process to another. So again, the, in the example a, a while ago, the state transitions from process one, um, the current process, and it will be terminated because it's already done, then there will be context switching. Okay, switching from one process to another. And then we also have preemption, stopping a process to give another process a chance to execute. Like for example, um, there's an existing process um, that's very long, and then and we'll, we'll learn that in the next module. So. And then there's another process in the queue okay, with, uh, with, uh, with just a, a, a short um, um short time needed to execute okay so what the operating system will do is it will preempt it will stop the current process because it's still um very long and then it will allow the the next process in queue to execute okay, so we call that preemption and then we also have polling so when we say polling is checking the health of the device usually by doing um, diagnostics, okay, power on self-test, or some cases, pinging, sending ICMP echo request and echo reply. Um, now let's go to data management and file organization. So for data management, it's, it says that it's the control program that manages data input and output. Okay. Um, in, in some cases, or in most cases, we see it as I slash O or IO. Okay. It also provides various file organization methods such as sequential organization, direct organization, and index organization. Um, it also works as a bridge between lo logical files processed within a program and physical files whose structures are different. Okay. So it allows programmers not to worry about the physical structure of the uh, file. So the access methods, we have sequential, direct, and dynamic access. <clears throat> um, uh, in the, there's a subject that uh, discusses this further. It's called computer architecture and computer organization. So when we say sequential access, processing files sequentially from the beginning. Usually the example of it is <coughs> um, it's the tape or the regular, the traditional hard disk that we have, uh, the mechanical one. The next is direct access, processing a specific record directly. Okay. And dynamic access. So for direct access, uh, an example would be um, SDD, um, uh, sorry, SSD, solid state, okay. <clears throat> or the USB, or flash drive, sorry. Uh, and then we have the dynamic access. So using direct access to find and position a record followed by a sequential access. Okay. <clears throat> For file organization, so we have um, a variety too. So we have sequential, okay. we have direct. So we have defined this in the previous slide. And then index, okay. so direct access by index and sequential access are possible. So um in some algorithms they have that wherein they put index on the um on the files for easy access no? um so it will not be too costly and then partition organization files so one file contains uh, multiple sequential organization files okay. 
And then we also have hierarchical file systems. So Unix and Windows make use of hierarchical systems as mechanisms uh, to manage files efficiently. So <clears throat> usually for um, here is an example of um, um, a file system that has a um, hierarchical structure. Okay. So for Unix, we start with the root directory. It's in the topmost directory. Okay. And then we have the subdirectories. Now. And then directories underneath. It can even have files under the directory or another, uh, another subdirectory. Okay. For um, file manipulation, so when searching for a file, we designate the path showing in which directory the file is located. So we have the absolute path. Okay, so designating a path from the root directory, uh, we start with um, a leading symbol, a forward slash, um, which indicates the root directory. Okay. For the relative path, it's designating a path from the current um, directory. So the designate file two when the current directory is directory two. So we have dear for uh, forward slash. Sorry, it's not forward slash. It's backslash. Pala. Backslash file two. Um, so in the absolute but in the absolute path example, it's also using backslash. Mm. Now let's go to memory management. So for memory management. Okay, so it uses two types of memory, the real memory and the virtual memory. So um, it makes the most effective use of the memory as well as compensating for any lack of the main memory capacity. Um, so why why do we have a virtual memory? So let's say, for example, you have um, an, an application that is what? Um, the size is 100, gig, 100 GB. Okay, and your memory is only uh, 8 gig. So the 100 gig cannot fit in the 8 gig memory. So the the purpose now is to just load the part of the 100 gig that you need to the to the RAM, and then leave the the add the other the rest in the virtual memory. <coughs> So it makes the most effective use, okay? So um, we're, we're trying to optimize the, the or maximize the, the, the memory for processes that should execute at the moment. So the real memory system, so it's the system that manages the physical space of the main memory. So it can be controlled in various ways by partition, swapping, relocation, and overlay methods. So we'll also do this in module three. Okay, so when we say partition, when a program is placed in the main memory, the main, the main memory is partitioned into several partitions into which the program is loaded. So swapping um, refers to the execution as the program keeps switching back and forth between the main memory and auxiliary stage. So for example, if you need the, the process, then you you swap it in okay, from the auxiliary stage to the main memory. And then if you don't need it anymore, you swap it out. So the space in, 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 in the main memory is maximized. Okay. Relocation. Okay, so when we say relocation, it refers to the function wherein a program already assigned to a certain area is restored in another location. Like for example, if the um, so there are many variants. Like for example, um, um, you have spaces okay available in the memory that um, um, that might be available for the application. However, there's a part there in um, that the current process is using okay, that um that blocks the application in queue from running okay so what it does is it relocates that part of the process existing process to another location so that the um the application in queue will be able to to load in the in the main memory okay <clears throat> 
And then we also have virtual memory. So virtual memory provides a large capacity of storage space regardless of the size of the main memory. Um, but the caveat here is that the virtual memory is very slow. No? <laughs> okay, so we call it <clears throat> auxiliary storage and only the parts necessary for execution are loaded in the main memory. No? So some of the strategies include page, um, segment, and segment page. So in the page method, we'll do this uh, in, in, the, in the next module. So. Um, so in the page method, the program is partitioned to units of fixed size called pages. A page then becomes the unit for loading into the real memory. The pages are managed by a page table, which has one entry for each page of virtual memory. So you try to divide it equally using a fixed um, page size and then you you um, you divide it and put it in the virtual memory and then um, just get the part that will have to be executed and put it in the main memory okay so um, the second is segment method so in the met in this method Programs and logical sets of data is considered segments. So virtual address consists of segment numbers and addresses within the segments. And the third one is segment page method. Okay, so this is an improved version of the segment method in which segments are further partitioned into pages. So the real address are accessed in the order of segment, then page, then relative displacement within the page. Now for um, <clears throat> paging algorithms, so we have uh, page fault interruption. So it happens if a page necessary for passing is not found in the real memory. And then we have page in when the page is read um, into the real memory from the virtual memory. And then page out, um, it, it's a move, it's to move an unnecessary page out of virtual memory. So page in and page out, when you combine them together, this is called paging. Okay, so removing um, a necessary page and um, when the page is written to real memory from the virtual memory, the actual process of these two are called, uh, the process is called paging. And last is slashing. So it happens when the paging occurs frequently and the time for execution of the control program increases and reduces the overall performance <clears throat> so last would be the page out methods in the page out methods it's used to minimize the occurrence of slashing as much as possible so there are two methods the first one is the lru or the least recently used okay, wherein the pages are compared on the time elapsed since the last referencing the page with the longest elapsed time is page out and the next one is the FIFO or the first in first out. Where in the page with the longest elapsed time up to the present is page out. So for, for more details of the memory management, this will be specifically discussed on module three. Okay. But for now we need to understand, we just need to understand the concepts behind it. Um, and how how is it applied? Um on the back end. Okay. So this sums up the um, the topics for the um, OS concepts. No? Uh, for your exercise, uh, so you're, you're going to um, analyze two operating systems. So discuss no? what are major differences between Android, mobile, and Windows 10 when it comes to the following features. So compare and contrast. Okay, job management, task management, data management, and file organization, and memory management. Okay, second, what are the points of improvement of Android and Windows 10 based on your research? Okay, so provide at least five technical and or scholarly references in your paper. Submit in PDF format, and it will be presented during class next meeting. Okay. Uh, and for your deliverables, so submit your learning log one. There's the link. Okay, just answer it, provide your feedback and your sharing, okay, and then submit your exercise one in PDF. 
and then start looking for a new or niche operating system that you will study for your final paper. So um, if you have any concerns or questions, you can email or um, send a message in Messenger. Okay, so this ends um, our module one and um, I hope um, you learn some of the important operating system concepts. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you in the next module.